seeing that captive rear process, um, you know, getting the animals used to actually becoming predators uh, is really cool. So then you do get to see right in front of your face them snatching up a crayfish because yeah. um, it's all really fast and, like we said, aggressive. The award-winning Tennessee Wildcast is on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, wildlife watching, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. We're glad you're tuning in. Thanks for watching and for listening. We've got another great show for you today lined up. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, the snot otter, which uh, we'll leave you hanging there on that what? one. <laughs> I'll let y'all think about that for a minute. Mr. Don King helping me co-host. You bet, Jason. Thanks for the invite. And um, I know I'm I'm going to jump up and uh, thank our one of our radio stations. Uh, actually, it's our uh, flagship. We, it was the first station Very first. that uh, started carrying Wildcast uh, several years ago in Cowan, Tennessee, WZYX. We're on Saturdays at 6 in the morning. Uh, 1440 AM, 94.5 FM, and 94, 95.3 FM, WZYX in Cowan. Awesome. We appreciate them very much, as well as our other radio stations. Yes, we thank them all. Uh, great. Uh, it's great to be the first, though. It was uh, exactly. got, got the ball rolling. Yep, so. that's right. We appreciate them very much for uh, for being a, a Tennessee Wildcast radio partner. Uh huh. And uh, yeah, that's awesome. So I mentioned snot otter as yeah. the as the show started there, and uh, if you know what that is, it's the hellbender. Uh huh. It's a pretty cool creature, and we're going to get into that today. We brought back uh, Josh Campbell and Mallory Tate to help us. Uh, break this down and learn more about them. That's so, great. Thank you, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Great to be back on such short, short notice. <laughs> <laughs> Quick turnaround. Wasn't it, it was. It was. <laughs> we had so much fun talking about bats last time they were here that we had to sneak in another show today. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, restoring snot otters in Tennessee. You gave this presentation at the commission meeting last, uh, well, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I thought, well, this would be a great topic for a show, and we could dive right into this. But um, I guess. From the top, tell us what a hellbender is and kind of get us started on, on what we're going to talk about today. So a uh, hellbender is an amphibian, and it's a salamander, but it's an aquatic salamander. So it's, it's actually one that people don't see a lot here in the state, um, and they're not very familiar with. Uh, so when they counter it, it, it can kind of instill some fear. Right, yeah. Um, and, it, and it's got some odd names over the years. Uh, it's not otters one because of the uh -huh. amount of uh, slime on its skin. Okay. But, you know, the slime's not for us, to, or it's not to ward us off. It's it's to protect the animal. Uh -huh. um, and then it's been called the devil dog. And hmm. uh, some places, it, you know, people will actually nail them to trees if they, they catch them because it kind of breaks a curse in their mind. So, wow. Uh, so I hadn't it, heard that one. No, yeah, that's first. Yeah, oh, wow. so there's been a few places where they they do get nailed to trees from time to time so and and every once in a while we have a fisherman that calls in that actually has caught one on hook and line or um catch one on a trout line in, in a large bottle so what body the water. heck is this yeah yeah <laughs> so they're really cool animals um and, and one the agency's been working with uh, again for for 10 or, 10 or 12 years uh here in the state trying to figure out uh, um as much as we can about it so because uh, awesome. it, it, it's a good keystone or or species that indicates what may or may not be going on in, in some of our aquatic environments because it does rely on, on the aquatic uh, environment so different things could have impacts to it and so if there's a loss of hellbenders that indicates that maybe something's going on in that system so, right right um, and so so we've been looking at that it's so cool you guys deal with uh, critters that we don't see all that often, you yes. know that that we that are there, and uh, and we appreciate when we know about them. But a lot of people just don't ever encounter them. And uh, but you guys spend your careers taking care of them, the ones that are lesser known and and uh, seldom seen, you know. So it that's is, cool. yeah. And and uh, one of the things you, we mentioned in the last one, uh, species of greatest conservation need, and, and our division kind of oversees um, um, actions or conservation measures that to, to kind of help. You know, get the species of greatest conservation need off the list. Yeah. Uh, but there's almost, in, in counting plants, there's almost 1,500 species of greatest conservation need in the state. Um, and, mm. and so there's a lot of things in the state, as biodiverse as Tennessee is, there's a lot of things we're concerned about. Uh -huh. So, And the hellbender is one of those. So, one of many. 
Awesome. So, well, let's dive in or get something else Oh, well, I, I was just going to say, and I'm sure we'll come across it as uh, Josh dives into what we're going to be talking about today, but one of the take-homes I got from your presentation when I was at the meeting was um, the loss of habitat through people going to a stream and deciding they they want to take rocks and stack them and see yeah. how high they can stack them just for fun it's one of those things that is picked up in popularity you see it a lot on facebook and social media where where they they're taking these great pictures of of and doing amazing things architecturally stacking these rocks and get them to bend and stay standing but but when you pull those rocks out of that that stream or creek you're you're actually removing habitat right. for for animals, right. uh, not just hellbenders. There's a lot of aquatic species that utilize hmm. uh, those rocks and things for cover and uh-huh. um, in the stream. So, and and it's a big campaign for a lot of agencies, not just TWRA, but uh, the don't stack the rocks campaign. Sure, um, to to keep from pulling those those rocks out of the stream. An agency that also deals with this rock stacking issue uh, worded it really well by saying that you picking up this one rock that this hellbender has worked so hard to nest under is like a tornado picking up the perfect house that you've put together for 10 years, Uh, throwing it over there for an Instagram post. Right. Wow. Short-lived. Yes. Yeah, Yeah. that's a good way to put it. I like that. Well, um, we're going to jump into a presentation. If you're listening to the show today, go back and watch this one because there'll be some pictures and some interaction here on the screen that you can can check out. But go ahead, Josh. Let's jump in. And uh, like you said, we gave this presentation at the commission meeting. I thought it was cool to kind of hit on. Yeah, so uh, one of one of the things I wanted to start off with are some of the common myths associated with hellbenders. Because like like I mentioned, uh, uh, people um, uh, when they see it or encounter it, it kind of steals a little bit of fear. And, and and there's been some urban legends that have been created around or around the species over the years. Uh-huh. And, and the species is not poisonous; it's not venomous. Uh, they do have a nasty bite. Uh, oh, really? Um, they they've got aggressive. a lot of yes, they can be aggressive, and and they've got a lot of small teeth because of their preferred prey. Um, and, and so you got to have those teeth to hold them. So they, they bite. The bite's painful, but there's no poison or venom associated with the bite. So it, And I've seen some researchers come out of the, the water with, with a lot of blood pull, pulling down their hands and things like that. So, so one, of the, one of the things I've noticed, too, is you, you look at the animal just, just floating along, kind of swimming comfortably, and you think, wow, that's very docile, mm-hmm. moves very slow and slow motion, and then you see it feed. Yes, it's, it's, I actually uh, consider them our one um, amphibian that could be considered charismatic megafauna <laughs> because they're so cool to watch. Yeah. They're pretty big, and they are pretty aggressive. So yeah. they'll fight. They'll tear apart some snakes. Mm. They'll eat snakes. Really, I think they're worthy of a Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> when they move, they are lightning fast. I mean, yeah. Yes. Just looking at them at the zoo, if we've been over there looking at some of the species, you know, the the samples they've got there that they're raising. There. Yeah, there's been many hellbenders m- missed because if you don't get under that rock quick enough, they're gone. Yeah. So, but uh, the, the other, one of the other myths is the, is the fact that they slime lines. Um, you know, they see that fishing line go in the water and just kind of make fishing not fun for you they'll slime your lines which apparently is cons- mm. construed as you know having an effect on on somebody's ability to catch fish um, but the other one is is because they're such large animals with huge appetites that they impact the fisheries and in, in the streams that they reside in and that's actually not the case they you know they they feed uh primarily on crayfish um but uh, anything that floats through these these cover rocks uh, small fish, crayfish, they're, they're going to suck up. It, it, just to watch them feed sometimes, uh, it's kind of like a small vacuum cleaner. That big <laughs> mouth opens yeah. up and it gets sucked in. That's uh, a great photo. It, yeah. yeah. And, um, but uh, they, they don't have an impact on, on our trout fisheries or bass fisheries or things like that. So Okay. Good to know. Uh, it is the state's largest salamander. Uh, they can get up to uh, lengths of, of 30 inches. Uh, and they can weigh in excess of about three pounds. Wow! Yeah, so they're they're big animals. Uh, they're very long lived animals. Uh, they can live in the wild for up to thirty years, uh, which is pretty important because an animal that lives long like that, uh, and, and most amphibians have high reproductive outputs. They can contribute a lot of animals uh, to the to the population over their the the course of their life. Right. So it's pretty important. I mean, you see from the picture 
uh, very flattened body and head that they use to get underneath these big cover rocks in yeah. the streams and rivers. But you also see another characteristic in the photo is how much skin they have, which is very important. Uh, and especially down the sides, you see a lot of folds and, and uh-huh. wrinkles along those sides. And that's because that the, even though they have lungs, they actually most of the oxygen they get in, they pull through their skin. Um, uh, so it tra- transfers from, from the water through their skin. Can they uh, breathe outside of the water? They can, um, but it's really thought that the um, the lungs are for buoyancy more than they are for, for mm. breathing. So most of that oxygen exchange occurs through the skin mm. in the water. Okay. So, um, and then another interesting thing is their stay-at-home dads. Um, the, the females will actually, well, when the male excavates a nest underneath these cover rocks, uh-huh. um, the, the f- female will go in, lay the eggs, the the They'll be fertilized, uh, and then the female leaves, and the male stays behind, and he actually guards and protects the eggs for about 45 to 60 days until they okay. hatch. Wow. Um, so it's pretty pretty neat to see that the males actually provide the parental care. The roles change. Though. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's neat to look at them because they're uh, – they, Kind of resemble the rocks and things that you see in the water. Some of those pictures, it's kind of if you're not know what you're looking for, sometimes it can yeah. be kind of camouflaged. Yes, that color, color and patter, patterning on on the hellbenders actually yeah. varies by by each individual, and and it blends in perfectly with a lot of these streams, uh, stream bottoms. So, yeah. uh, they, these animals like to uh, the 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 flowing uh, habitats of rivers and streams and creeks, uh, usually that uh, have large cover rocks. Um, that they, they like that water to be cool and highly oxygenated. Mm-hmm. Uh, generally, that cool water actually allows for more oxygen exchange, uh, so that's why they prefer that cool, cool water. And actually, even though there's a reduction in the number of streams that meet those requirements, there's actually a lot of streams uh, all the way over here to Middle Tennessee that that actually work. In. A lot of people associate with mountain streams in East Tennessee, but we have some streams here in Middle Tennessee that that actually are preferred by the hellbender. Awesome, and they're. Shallow, shallow streams, right? And you don't find them in deep, deep water, do you? Well, yeah, they or can you? use some okay. deep pools and, and the cover objects uh, in those deep pools. Okay. Uh, we've had some some people that have actually done some some diving and snorkeling for some of the deeper pools. Gotcha. Okay. Um, cool. But usually, when we search the streams and rivers, we actually reduce that to what we can safely wade. Uh, okay. Uh, because usually, the way I've done it in the past is you go downstream, you know, one or two miles, and then you wade upstream searching for the hellbenders. Um, and, and that way the water's flowing all the debris behind you, and you can see the hellbenders under the walks. Right. And then you just swim over the deep pools. So <laughs> yes, uh, I don't know if that's the way you guys have done it. So Yeah, for the most part, when we uh, did this project, there were a few deep pools, and, you know, you've got some of the professors at TSU holding people <laughs> down so they can get under these rocks. So yeah. it's pretty good. Um, but uh, the reason why this project got started is because um, we had about 600 occurrences in our database, um, and, and most of those were 20 years old or older. Uh-huh. Uh, so we actually wanted to revisit these sites and, and kind of put them out together to show what that looked like pre-2000. Uh, you can see there's a lot of dots on the map. Uh, but then we, we started doing the surveys. We found out that we've lost a lot of our populations here in Middle Tennessee uh, and then along the Cumberland Plateau for, mm-hmm. for a lot of different reasons. Uh, so in 2016, we actually listed this um, species as state endangered mm. uh, because of the concerns and the number of populations we had lost. Okay. So, um, but then the work. This is this right here is a video of what the surveys look like, basically lifting these large cover objects up and, and um, pulling the hellbenders out. Don't so, try this at home, right? No, no. And you got to be permitted um, uh, to to do this type of work through the agency. Uh, depending on where that works at, you may have to have additional permits. Um, uh, from from other agencies as well. Mm-hmm. So it's cool to see y'all hands on how how it all happens. It, it is, and and one of the things that we do when we get those uh, animals um, out of the water, we we take of course the measurements and sex on them and age them and different things like that. But we take a swab of their skin uh, so that we can actually identify the potential diseases that they may be harboring. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we also take a tail clip so we can do genetics with the species. Cool. Uh, and that's kind of leads me here to this next map. And this is some of the, because one of the things that was discussed early on was the need to possibly augment some of these populations with animals from across the state. So that's why we took the tail clips when we found them. We wanted to actually get a better idea of what our genetics were. Because mm-hmm. um, there's um, a few subspecies. One's actually recognized as endangered by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, it's the Ozark Hellbender. And uh, so we wanted to make sure that um, 
the just basically determine what that genetic diversity was. Um, and, and there's three populations that kind of we had enough information on to say beyond a shadow of a doubt that these are different from one another. Even though it's the same species, there's enough diversity between these that they clade out together. Hmm. Um, and, and that's down in southeast Tennessee. All the other dots that have white that aren't filled in, um, they kind of clade together. So the upper east Tennessee animals clade together. Uh, and then the Cumberland. Tennessee River and, and Duck Rivers clay together. We just didn't have enough samples to actually shade in those circles. So gotcha. uh, we're hoping to get more more samples over time. So, but we know that our animals in Southwest Middle Tennessee are a little bit different than those in East Tennessee. All right, you can say that with some of the people too. No, yeah. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so so during our work uh, survey work with our partners, uh, one of the biggest causes of declines is, is habitat loss and degradation mm. um, and, and it's kind of crazy to think but a lot of these big rocks are becoming embedded sounds like an odd word but the the sediment that's flowing through our streams actually collects around these rocks and and it's like concrete they they closes become, them off it then to access doesn't it, it does and so the helminters are forced from their homes and or they can't find any other homes um, and of course that type of uh, sediment that's flowing through there it affects water quality, which has an impact to younger hellbenders. And then some of the, the, the removal of timber around streams and things like that uh, affects water temperature. Hmm. Uh, but we also found in some cases where we had a lack of connectivity, uh, where some dams have been built. So you don't have animals moving freely in and out of the population, which has an effect. Um, and then we had um, um, disease is creating some issues. And of course, here's a picture somebody took uh, from outside the state, uh, but you can see where the, the large cover objects are, are removed. and Stacking, yeah. Stacking, and, and whether this animal died, you know, from people stomping on it while those those uh, rocks were removed or was predated because it didn't have cover, that's unknown. But either one can happen, and that has a huge impact to the species. Sure. So. It's crazy to see in that photo. You can really tell that there's no structure or anything around it you know it's it's just the sand yep. or silt or whatever on the bottom yeah and and mallory was talking about how they fight each other you know that these animals will bite each other's toes off and things like that mm -hmm. um and, and this animal is actually missing a few toes on its front four forearm or forelimb so um but yeah so they they're pretty nasty to each other but we we can't <laughs> move their habitat around to where they they, they won't survive so. right uh the, the other big thing we noticed too was was the we didn't have any juvenile hellbenders in most of the populations we surveyed. Mostly so adults. It was all all adults. Uh, there's a couple of populations in East Tennessee where we get a lot of different age classes, so a lot of different sized animals, which represents different years of recruitment into those populations. But here in Middle Tennessee, no no um, different age classes. It was just all large adults. Hmm. Uh, some some cases old adults, and so there's no recruiting going on in these populations. So. Um, we're seeing reproduction. We're just not seeing from egg hatching to a different age class. Um, so something's having an impact to that. Mm. Uh, we think some of it's a lack of habitat because hellbenders, juvenile hellbenders are thought to use the, the interstitial spaces of rock and cobble. So all those little spaces that aren't filled with sediment, that's where these hellbenders get down and, and they seek cover from predators and, and they develop into uh, the smaller class individuals. So, hmm. but we also bigger than that. Uh, UT uh, has been doing quite a bit of disease research on amphibians in the state. Um, hellbenders, juvenile hellbenders, are highly susceptible to disease. So, a lot of these hmm. animals are likely succumbing to infections from uh, different rhinoviruses or chytrids uh, that are that are in these watersheds. And so, that just kind of zaps hmm. those those age classes from yeah. from recruiting. So. And then we, we partnered, uh, we identified a, a site in southwest uh, Middle Tennessee uh, on Laurel Hill, WMA. And uh, they had a, a, Laurel Hill has a pretty good population of, of hellbenders. Um, and so that gave us something to start start from. Sure. And partnered with the Nashville Zoo and they um, uh, started collecting eggs, taking them back to the zoo and, and hatching them off. And so uh, after about five years, we decided it was time to turn them loose, that they'd gotten big enough to disease wouldn't be an issue or um, um, the predation would be less likely, and so we turned turned our first group loose last year. It was 26 animals mm, uh, cool. back into the little buffaloes. It's the first time it's happened in the state, so um, so we were pretty excited about that. And we plan to do this uh, again this coming year in 2022. 
So good deal. Well, short, uh, real quick plug. We did a show out at the National Zoo not uh, a little while ago, I guess. Check the archives; you can see that show and some right. of those interviews with some of those biologists there. Uh-huh. So that was fun. Yeah, uh, they get a lot of stuff going on. They're they're helping the biodiversity division out on several different things. So, uh, Hellbenders is the big project they're helping us out with right now. So. I remember during our visit there, they were showing us some concrete structures that they had. Uh, that were poured and mm-hmm. and, and made for uh, habitat. Was, are those still effective? You think they they are. Um, uh, that that's a, it's a concrete nest box. Uh-huh. And actually, this next video will have uh, uh, you'll see the the end or the entrance to that nest box uh, in the water. And so that's a one way to help augment the loss of habitat. And uh-huh. uh, it's basically just a, a big concrete cavity that's got one entrance in it, uh, entrance and an exit. It's all the same hole, and they take them out and, and put them in the streams and river and, and sink them and cover them up with larger rocks so they don't float down the river. Yeah. Uh, and that's a way to augment that habitat for hellmenders. Okay. Uh, it's good for, for catfish as well. So, uh, <laughs> but. For all those folks who like to, to gravel. Gr- yeah, gravel or what do they call it? Uh, <laughs> Noodle. Noodle, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So and here's a, a video of a, one of the animals being turned loose, and you can see like that hole uh, for the, the concrete Oh uh, yeah, official nesting box. So uh, those things, and this is the animal going in. It's about a four or five year old animal. Um, so being turned loose for the first time in Tennessee, it's pretty exciting that day. That is neat. So history in the making. Yeah, and so we're we're going to continue this project. Um, we've we've got several different co- cohorts or, or groups of individuals we intend to turn loose. Like I said, one a uh, couple of cohorts here in 2022, and and. Uh, they they're still collecting gags and, and hatching them off. So we'll continue this in the future. But then we have a, another head starting program. Uh, the Forest Service has partnered with uh, the Chattanooga Zoo, and so they're doing a similar project over in East Tennessee okay. to augment some of the streams where populations are declining or or uh, been lost over time. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, that's great. And then we talked about don't move the rocks. Uh, these are some examples of the signs that are going to be placed out. Um, 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 on some of these sites where hellbenders, one, the one on the left kind of indicates what to do if you catch a hellbender, um, um, who to contact, and uh, the other is, is talking about don't move in the rocks. So so if you, right there, it says it on the sign, but if you catch one with hook and line, what, what do you do? Uh, the easiest thing to do would be to cut the line and turn the animal loose. Leave it, leave the hook? Yeah. Okay. It, it should uh, rust out over time or... or uh, be removed. I think you would do with barbed hooks these days. I think you do more damage to the animal trying to remove the hook, um, and and they're very hard to hold on to. So I can only imagine <laughs> trying to take a hook out of a hellbender. So wow. But then you get your hand too close, they might snap. Exactly. It. <laughs> exactly. So and but uh, and I think that's yeah. So this is the the list of the partners we've worked with over the years and still active with. Uh, we got a grad stu- student from Tennessee State that all the hell- hellbenders we turn loose, the, they have transmitters in them, so we track them over time. They also have uh, pit tags, which are passive integrated transponders. Mm-hmm. So every hellbender has its own unique identifier. Um, so when we go to the stream, we can say this is this this animal and this it's distinguished from all the others. Uh, so. Uh, Very similar to what they do on fish, too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Same and, kind of tag. Yeah, and some some researchers actually use that for bats too. So it's okay. It's cool. technology that's been used across different species. So it's pretty pretty neat. So awesome. Well, Mallory, you haven't said a whole lot because this was really <laughs> jo- Josh's presentation. I'm sorry. No, you're good. But I just want to say, you know, the, some of the earlier projects you worked with some of these. Tell us what some of the experiences you had out there. What was one of the most exciting times with you? You know, working with Most these animals. Most exciting time would be when we did get to release that first cohort. Yeah. Um, it's always really special to see these animals that have been raised captive, which I wanted to emphasize how important that step is. Um, something that Josh just barely missed was that <laughs> they, <laughs> um, they don't reach sexual maturity until about seven years old. So that's the big importance of being able to captive rear these animals. Like he said, we're missing that that class uh-huh. just below seven years so there's a whole a whole group of animals a whole year of or several years a decade mm-hmm. even that we're going to miss um mm-hmm. as these older um animals do start to die off just naturally so we keep going much longer without that middle class and that's where we do reach extirpation right. in this one population um so having the zoo be able to rear these animals um kind of gives us a little bit more time to figure out what 
what the problem in the stream system is. Right. Um, so that's a really important step. So these animals that are being released are just shy of that uh, reproduction age. Um, so And a lot less susceptible to being predated and, and uh, some of the other things that the younger class would be right, subject right, to, right? Right. Um, so that that part in itself is such a huge step to this pro this whole process of right. like i said before trying to figure out why these animals are declining or what what's going mm -hmm. wrong with the stream system um but yeah so i'd say the release is really special but also seeing that captive rear process um you know getting the animals used to actually becoming predators uh is really cool so then you do <laughs> get to see right in front of your face them snatching up a crayfish yeah. um because it's all really fast and, like we said, aggressive. Um, so I really enjoy yeah. pretty much every part of it. The telemetry, seeing what these animals are using once they're released has been very interesting. And just working with partners is always interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah, and she, she mentioned something, too. Uh, one of the funny stories from from my perspective is, is so these animals are, are collected as eggs. And they're hatched in the zoo, so they've really never experienced anything in the wild. Mm. So part of the project is is trying to teach them to be wild on their own. So it's not necessarily teaching, but get them to be wild. Uh -huh. And and so they're initially raised on mealworms and fish and things like that. But then their main predators are crayfish. So we started bringing crayfish into them. And the uh -huh. first hellbender that sucked up a crayfish was like, oh, my gosh, what have I got? And he <laughs> spit it out. Uh, so it actually takes a little bit of time to get these guys mm back onto a natural prey source and so we're spending okay. a lot of time or at least the zoo is uh trying to get these animals to go from what they're used to to what they need to be eating so uh -huh. that way when we turn them loose it's not an additive stress and and they're they're doing what they're supposed to do in the wild trying to find that time when it's the right time to introduce that that type of food yes. you know i mean Absolutely. maybe you can introduce it earlier to where i don't know it's not so afraid of what is that when I sucked it in? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Clamps yeah. down on a cheek inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. No, that's right. not what I want. I want that fish, <laughs> that mealworm. Softer. Yeah. Well, this has been good. Uh, thank you guys for what you do. I know people out there may not realize that you do this work and some of the stuff that's going on and all these partners that we have. So it's it's good to hear this every now and again and, and remind us that uh, there's a lot of fun stuff, a lot of good stuff going on oh, yeah. out there. Yeah, we, we got our hands in a lot of different things and all a lot of different animals in, in our division. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of projects like this, not just for, for amphibians and bats, but other species as well. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, Don, anything else? I think we're good. Thank, right. thank you guys for coming in. We appreciate you. Thank you. Taking care of these uh, seldom seen, seldom heard about uh, species, you know, that are, that are so much, so cool and so much fun. Well, if you want to... Uh, watch the show and see some of these snot otters or, or whatever you may want, may call them. Uh, check out the, the Wildcast on YouTube or Facebook and go watch the show. But uh, we appreciate everybody out there tuning in and we'll see you next time. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for tuning in. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week. We'll see you then.